Hello everyone and welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, my monthly Q&A series, and today I'm gonna to answer a very serious question about why some tech YouTube channels seem to be slowly dying. Of course, there's the obvious answer, it's because of the GPU shortage, but I have another answer that might be even more intriguing than that. But this is the teaser intro part of the video, so I can't tell you more for now. Let's move on. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by MSI's MPG Series Z590 motherboards, built for Intel 11th Gen Core processors. Whether you prefer the blacked out look of the Gaming Plus, the Wi-Fi 6E support of the Edge Wi-Fi, or the extra power for overclocking provided by the Z590 Force or the Carbon Wi-Fi, every board is packed with features like 2.5 gig LAN, 20 gigabit USB 3.2, Audio Boost 5, premium VRM cooling, and of course, PCI Express Gen 4 support with supplemental PCIe power. RGB2? Yes, RGB2. Click the sponsor link in the description for more on the MPG Z590 motherboards from MSI. So we begin as usual with a look at past probing Pauls. There is a playlist if you guys are interested. We're in episode 63 now. We're getting dangerously close to episode 69, giggity. But of course, if you have questions for me to answer in next month's episode or the next time I do this, leave them in the comment section down below. And if it's a good question that I happen to know the answer to, I'll try to answer it. But let's get into it now with the hard hitting questions that you guys asked me as of the last episode. First one here is from Stents the Boss. What wrist rest do you use? I'm looking for a nice one, ears look comfy. Thank you Stents for the other uplifting words here as well. And just to clarify here, this is a question I have been asked just with, with much regularity over the course of the time that I've been doing, I think this uh, probing paw in particular, probably because it's visible here, but this is a handstands wrist rest. It's just got little micro beads inside. And I agree, it's a nice one. I like it a lot. I like to have good ergonomic position for my wrist. You know, it should be kept nice and flat like that. And I've linked this in descriptions in the past, but since the question continues to come up, I thought I'd lead with it today. There it is available on Amazon. It's only about $13 right now. So uh, yeah, I'll put a link to that in the description if you are interested. Thank you, Stents the Boss, for your question. Let's move to Daxton Anderson next, who's, he's asking the hard hitting question here. And uh, I, I took some liberties here by sort of rephrasing this into the title of the video, but uh, he's also providing me with some port and some suggestions for other content, because in the last video, I was kind of talking about the process of making tech YouTube videos and what's good about it right now, what's bad about it right now. But tech is dead right now. And a lot of people seem to have this opinion. I'm not necessarily sure it's because nothing new is coming out, but I did want to address this because it's something that I've considered a lot. And I don't know if you guys watching tech YouTube videos are more interested in you know the tech side of it, building computers, the type of content that we usually make, or if you're more interested in kind of my perspective on the actual process of creating videos for YouTube in the tech space. Now for my part, in terms of video performance, I generally try to aim for like 100,000 views per video if I can manage it, if the video is good enough. If you guys like the video well enough, and looking at my recent videos, Videos, especially over the past, I don't know, three weeks or so when I've managed to get my production a little bit more up to speed and I've been actually hitting my three video a week quota. And I've been able to do that while maintaining, I think, a pretty reasonable work-life balance. So that's been positive for me, but my views are definitely down compared to what they were maybe a year or two years ago. But there's a lot of creators in the tech YouTube space. Some have larger followings than others. And as I've looked at different creators that I follow, I have generally a decent idea of kind of the typical view counts that their videos get. And you can just tell if that's something that you keep an eye on, view counts are down across the space in general. But it's all relative, of course, and my heart has really been going out to some of the YouTubers who don't have as large of a following who have been really suffering, especially when you have like my friend Brian, Brian Stroh, who does a channel BPS Customs, and he often pours a ton of work into his videos. And by the way, go, go over and subscribe to BPS Customs. I'll put a link in the description if you're interested. But he just posted this video, for example, a really cool video where he did a comedy 64 build. He did a mini ITX system, managed to fit it all into a Commodore 64, goes through a bunch of the details, including like soldering and stuff like that, and even finishes off with uh, some, some benchmark testing and stuff like that and showing the performance. A great video by Brian and something that I would suggest maybe shouldn't be affected by the GPU shortage because he's just doing a special custom build. He's not going and saying, hey, here's a build that you can do. Because that's what I think a lot of people have been frustrated with right now. And that's the first reason why I think a lot of tech channels, specifically in the PC space, are suffering right now is because people know that they can't get a GPU or that they'd have to pay three to five times the MSRP value of a GPU in order to get one. So they're just not interested or they've put that idea or that project of building a PC for gaming or work use or whatever on the back burner until the market conditions get better. And the market conditions have not gotten much better over the past uh, 
six to eight months. So the GPU shortage is definitely point number one. The second point I think, and one that a lot of tech YouTubers are definitely aware of, is that YouTube has changed how it works, definitely, at least in the past six months to a year. And they now have this stuff where each video that you post, and this is my most recent uh, tech news video post, which is doing so-so, it's doing okay. But you can see on this chart here, the blue line is the views it's actually getting. The gray lines here are kind of the, the typical range of views that a video that I post would normally get. And a video might do okay, and it might kind of hang out in the middle of this range, and that's all right. Or a video might do well, and if a video overperforms, YouTube has actually done a pretty good job of recommending that, and you'll often see a video that's doing well take off even more, because YouTube will think, oh, this is a good video, so we should recommend it to more people. However, if your video only does so-so, or kind of mediocre, if it starts to trail towards the lower end of this graph, unfortunately mine seems to have recovered, at least this morning, YouTube might decide that that video is not a good video, or not a video that YouTube wants to recommend to people because it's not getting the proper engagement, people aren't clicking on it, people aren't watching it lo long enough. The metrics that YouTube uses to determine whether a video is a good video or a bad video seem to have gotten a little bit more harsh, particularly for videos that might be a little bit more in the mediocre or low performing range, and those videos seem to get squashed and the views for them die more rapidly than they did in the past. So you can kind of see how with the extenuating circumstances of the GPU shortage causing enthusiasm to be dampened overall for these types of videos or videos in this category means there's a higher likelihood in general that a video is not going to perform well, it's going to hit that threshold, and then YouTube's going to be like, this is not a good video, therefore we're not going to show it to anyone anymore. But I mentioned a third factor in my assessment, and this is something that I haven't heard discussed or brought up very much, at least uh, amongst the circles of people that I talk to or online and Twitter and stuff. So if you go back 12 to 14 months to 2020, and I know you don't want to do that, but, but bear with me here. Uh, this video I posted in April of 2020, early April, and this is my how to build a $550 gaming PC in 2020. Unfortunately, you cannot build this system for $550 anymore, but more to the point, this video did quite well, getting about 2.5, almost 2.6 million views now, and this is part of the explosion of interest in PCs, PC building, just the general need for PC hardware, because at the time a bunch of people were switching from working in an office to needing to work at home, a bunch of people were being laid off or put on furlough because of the pandemic and were looking for recreational activities that they could do while on lockdown, so video games were uh, pretty high up on that priority list. So you had above average interest in PC building as a whole, and you had a bunch of parts being sold which actually contributed and led to the shortage that we are in right now, because that was combined with uh, the manufacturers at the time thinking like, oh, pandemic, we better dial back on our production. But now it is June 2021, more and more vaccines are being produced every single day, more and more people are getting vaccinated every single day. Here in the US, infection rates and hospitalization rates are way, way down. So I think a lot of people have a different mentality this year than they did a year ago. And whereas last year, people were more than happy to spend their disposable income on a new PC, this year they're thinking like, oh, I don't wanna stay at home and play video games anymore. I wanna go out and do things and travel or spend time with friends and the other things that people weren't able to do because there was a lockdown and a pandemic. So the enthusiasm, or I'd say the heightened interest in uh, PCs last year around like April, May, June, I think we're now seeing the opposite of that this year. We're seeing lower than average interest combined that with the GPU shortage, combine that with the way YouTube is behaving lately. So I think as a result of all of this, tech YouTubers are having a difficult time right now and are needing to find maybe just different ways of operating, different ways of pitching ideas, different ways of presenting the videos, just in order to claw some of that interest back. And hopefully this is all something that will get better as hopefully GPUs become more and more available, which hopefully is going to be happening soon. All right, that was a long answer for that one, so let's move on to Alberto Garcia Engineer, who is asking about AM5 motherboards, and thank you for your other comments as well, Alberto. He's asking if the first run AM5 motherboards that AMD releases will be worth buying, because in the past, sometimes I would say specifically with like the first generation of Ryzen, there were the 100 series motherboards, and at that time there was a very good reason to be skeptical of what AMD was coming out with on the CPU side, as well as the motherboards that they needed to slot into. With Ryzen first gen, AMD didn't have a very good track record going back eight or 10 years before that. And the motherboard manufacturers like your Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, pretty much all the main ones except maybe EVGA, kind of straddle the fence. They service both Intel and AMD. So they're gonna put more effort and more investments, uh, more development costs into what is selling more. So at that time, Intel was selling way more. 
But since then, AMD has clawed back more and more market share. So you can see that going from the first gen Ryzen motherboards, and now we have 400 series and 500 series as well. They've gotten better and better because the board manufacturers have seen the performance of Ryzen, both the actual CPU performance as well as like the sales performance. And they've said, okay, people are buying this, so it's worth our time to invest in making sure that the motherboards are well designed. Now for the next Ryzen platform, and this is still just a rumor, but supposedly going to be a Zen 4 based and Raphael is the code name that we're going for for the CPUs, but they're gonna be switching from a PGA or pin grid array to LGA. And again, this is still a rumor, but LGA 1718 and this image shared by XFi is uh, an AMD Raphael CPU or the pads beneath the CPU. Now, if you're not familiar with the difference between LGA and PGA, I highly recommend my LGA versus PGA video where I talk about the difference, pins being on the motherboard, pin, pins being on the CPU, maybe the pros and cons of either different method. But keep in mind that there are no inherent flaws to LGA or PGA. There, there's, there's just kind of differences between the two. So them switching to a new style or new type of socket isn't going to impact the motherboard that's built around that socket. That's not to say that there's never been any issues with like a new series of motherboards boards that's launched. I would go back to the Intel Sandy Bridge days and some of the issues they had back then. But a massive recall like that is actually pretty rare on the motherboard side. So if you are truly concerned, I would say just give it about a month or so after launch to make sure that there are no major issues that crop up immediately. And then beyond that, I wouldn't be too concerned about the quality of the motherboard or the switch from uh, PGA to LGA on the AMD side. I would expect the next gen motherboards to be just the same level of quality as the current gen B550 and X5 70 motherboards. But thank you for your question. Here's the next question from Jai Plays Games. Uh, thank you for your kind words as well. I'm glad my videos have helped you out. My question, how do I get started with building a DIY NAS? So if you want me to help you out, the uh, NAS that I most recently set up is the one that's in the bottom of Riptide. It's a 32 terabyte NAS, and this looks really complicated over here, but the uh, actual NAS is the system that's down in the bottom. That said, I used FreeNAS, and uh, I, I'm very happy to recommend uh, FreeNAS. It's a great solution uh, as like a free software solution, so you just have to sort of source the hardware. Speaking of which, sourcing the hardware, it might be a bigger challenge for you because getting hard drives right now, the prices on those have gone up a bit. But make sure you have a decent number of ideally identical hard drives. You probably wanna go with four or five to start. I did four eight terabyte drives in this particular setup. And then uh, you can check out my walkthrough here, which I'll, I will link in the description. I will also point you towards the Level One Techs YouTube channel where there's a lot more in-depth content on setting up free NAS and making it work, work in various different ways. And then for the rest of your hardware, aside from your hard drives, you can often get away with repurposing an old system. So if you have a maybe three to six year old system that uh, isn't really being used as a main system anymore, you can often take the internals from that, like CPU motherboard memory, and then repurpose that as a NAS box. And that's a great way to get up and running without having to spend too much money. You just, you need those hard drives for your main storage. It's also really good to have an SSD cache drive as well. Next question from Adam Jimenez. Uh, asking the real questions here. Paul, what would you do right now if you wanted or needed a gaming PC to build and I didn't have the connections I have right now? And I've definitely gotten this from people before where I'm sitting here trying to give advice. I'm like, here's how you can get this part and whatever. And they're like, Paul, look at all the graphics cards you have behind us. You don't know what the struggle is like. And while that's definitely true on some level, my struggle has been more with like the lack of interest from viewers because of the lack of GPUs that are widely available. But getting back to this question, what would I do? I would probably do what I've been recommending people do, which is get my hands on a decent APU setup uh, from AMD. So something like a 4650G or something like the 5600G that's supposed to come out at the beginning of August because I would want to get just a system that's up and running and functional. And then I would want to do whatever was necessary to buy a GPU for a reasonable or not absurd price. And that might mean going and waiting in line at Micro Center when I know they have stock coming in. That might even mean just having to wait a really long time until GPU prices in general come back down. But if I had a, a re one of the reasonable AMD APUs that are out right now, the, those actually do okay for gaming at lower resolutions, so I would have something to game on. I would have a functional system that I could use to do, you know, other work type stuff if I needed to remote into for a job or something like that. And hopefully that aligns with kind of the MO of my channel in general because I try to give people advice that I would give myself or that I would take myself. 
uh, and that's really how I would go about doing it. The 5600G, I know it's still not out for another like month and a half uh, or so, but that's the one that I, I really have my eye on. I hope there's enough stock of that that it's readily available because it's only supposed to be $260 at retail and the performance is close enough to a 5600X that you could use it with the APU and then when you got a graphics card, you wouldn't have to do anything to the system but take the graphics card, plug it in, connect the power to it probably, and then you could just use that CPU still. Thank you for that question though, Adam. Next question is from Patrick Wenzel. Uh, any chance you could walk us through finer points of selecting parts for a build, uh, ensuring components have cross -combat compatibility and are future-proofed? So I decided to answer this question because it's pointing to something that I normally do pretty regularly and I haven't done in quite a while. And that's because of the shortage and because I know interest isn't quite there as much. But going back to that uh, how to build a PC in 2020 video that I did last year, my plan is to do a, like a full blown tutorial for how to build every single year. So I have a new one for every year. And for 2021, I've been wanting to do one for some time. But what I told myself is I'm gonna wait until market conditions are a little bit better. So as I'm showing people how to build a computer, I can say, yes, you can build this too. And even if there's not a wide range of GPUs available, as long as there's something in the discrete market that's available, especially down in like the two to $300 range, I think I could get away with that. When I've been doing my how to build a PC tutorials, I usually do like a three parter. And the first part is usually all about what parts are what, choosing the right parts, and basically everything that would answer the question that you are asking, uh, or make a video that's in line with what you're asking me to make. For right now, the one I've done most recently that's kind of akin to that is my how to choose a motherboard three levels of skill video. This is another one that did really well. So I think what I could do until I feel like market conditions are good enough to do a full blown how to build tutorial, I could do something like this focused on a specific part. And I really like how this video went. So I could totally see myself applying that to other ones. So if you guys have a suggestion for what part of a PC you would want me to apply that to next, uh, leave me that comment down in the comment section below. Speaking of videos that people have suggested I make in the last probing poll, I talked about doing like a reaction to your builds type video. I got a, a bunch of mixed feedback on that to be perfectly honest, but quite a few people were saying that yes, they would like me to do that. But some good ideas here for kind of tweaking it to make it a little bit more unique to me and my channel and what I do, which is to uh, give people feedback that you know hopefully helps them, whether it's on the aesthetic level or the cho choice of components. So again, I'm making zero promises for right now, but I wanted to bring this up because it is a content piece today. I feel like I'm starting to steer a little bit more towards. And I did do this drop poll in the last video uh, where I got a, a fair amount of yes votes, but also a not insignificant number of no votes. So I hear from the people who are like, no, I don't want just another carbon copy of like, show me a rig and I'm going to sit there and make fun of it for a while. I will try to tweak and tune that to be uh, at least slightly more unique than that if I do go that route and make that content. And the final question here from Hillard Bishop asking to see awesome hardware come back once every other week or once every month. I can't promise to do it that often, but as I kind of teased last month, the awesome hardware charity livestream is returning. And you'll hear me in my videos and Kyle probably in his uh, plugging this over the uh, course of the next couple weeks, but the date is June 26th. That's a Saturday. We're planning on streaming from about 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. local time. That's Pacific time here in California. We're gonna be raising money through Extra Life for the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals and uh, it should be lots of fun. So if you guys have like suggestions for games you wanna see us play or that kind of thing, let me know. Uh, and if you guys are able to stop by uh, for that event, we would much appreciate it. And hey, if you got some cash to donate too, that would also be awesome. Kyle and I are both planning full system giveaways for that. I should have already had mine underway. Actually, the next video I post should be on that build. That's at least my plan as of right now when I'm filming this one. But that's all the time I have for filming this one. It's super hot this week and it's getting hotter and hotter as I speak right now. So I need to cut things off. Thank you guys so much for all of your comments and feedback and everything. All of the uh, encouraging words that have been sent my way over the past month or so. Things have really been uh, looking up recently. So I really appreciate that. If you guys wanna hit the thumbs up button on your way out, that is much appreciated. Subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more of my tech videos in the future. And check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy merchandise with the thumbscrew logo on it. It's all really nice, high quality stuff. Thanks again for watching everyone and we'll see you in the next video.